Hello, we are back. Uh, we are back in the track uh, sessions. So you are uh, today in the in the main track. Uh, we uh, we will talk about like API driven business. We will talk about uh, e digital transformation, and we will talk about the new players of the API economy. Uh, and I'm really glad to start this track with uh, Johnny Bufara, who is the CEO and founder of Hopin. Uh, hello, Johnny. How are you? Very good, Mehdi. It's a pleasure and um, uh, so happy to be here and uh, be at the event. Yeah, yeah. You're talking to a customer, right? Because since la last year, we are a customer of Hopin and where actually the, the platform is being, uh, is, is being held. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, such an amazing product. Thank you. Thank you so much for using it and I uh, hope you're having a good experience. Yeah, and I hope we hope also in the, uh, that as a, as attendees you enjoy the, the the experience. It has been it has evolved a lot over the year, uh, always in a good direction. So um, uh, yeah, so if you have any questions for Johnny, don't hesitate to put them in the comments or in in the chat. Uh, we I will be glad to to be your translator and to intermediary. But now the the story we we we, we baptize this fireside chat scaling like a rocket with APIs, right? But I think it's. Uh, it's the story a little bit of Hopin uh, somewhere. So maybe Johnny, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where do you come from, and and where did you get this idea of building an online conference platform? Absolutely. So for for uh, for me, a little bit about myself. My parents had fled uh, Lebanon during the civil war and moved to Sydney, Australia. I was born and raised there, and I spent a lot of my life moving around the world. I moved from. Uh, Papua New Guinea to Los Angeles to uh, uh, Manchester, UK, and eventually ended up in London. Uh, it was in London that I got quite ill. It was just after gra graduating university. Uh, I had been always developing stuff since I was a kid, and the goal for it was for me to either you know join a company or do my own thing again. Because uh, as a university, I'd done a small a small app that I sold for a little bit of money in my third year. Uh, and so uh, the goal was to do that. And what happened was I got sidetracked due to a uh, autoimmune issue uh, caused by food poisoning uh, that was uh, that I got abroad. And so what what what, then, what ended up happening was I spent about um, two years stuck at home, like really really ill and stuck at home, uh, unable to kind of um, operate in a very efficient way. And so what happened is uh, from there that I, that I was able to uh, figure out that in those two years, I wanted to basically make money. I wanted to make a living, but I'm stuck at home. I'm fully remote and I'm, uh, I'm sick. Uh, so how do I actually interact with people and how do I actually get people to give me a chance? And the best way to do that is by being face to face, whether it's on video or in person. But you need to get face to face. A cold re LinkedIn reach out never got anyone excited. Neither does an email. And so I'm sitting there trying to figure out a way that I can actually meet the people I'm interested in meeting. So, like for me, it was attending. I wanted to make uh, some get some gigs while I, that I could run part time, essentially as a software developer building things for people. And LinkedIn wasn't working, so I I said, okay, let me attend some of these virtual events and see if I can network with someone there. And about two and a half years ago, a virtual event was uh, something where you could maybe watch a video with 10,000 other people and you still wouldn't know anything about the 10,000 people who are watching with you. you. You wouldn't be able to reach out to them and you're just watching like a, you may as well watch the recorded video version of it. And that was the experience that led me to want to create Hopin because I, I wanted to network with people. I had attended in-person events and said, I got not only the content value, but the, also the value of being able to interact, see what people are saying, maybe speak with a few people, etc. Maybe work, with, look at what the sponsors are doing, get the offers. This whole picture didn't exist, and so that's where uh, Hopin came from. And it took about like you know only a few months later, and uh, so after I noticed that, sorry, two years after I had recovered, but towards the end of that two years is when I wanted to create. Uh, I started building Hopin. And it took me about a year to build the initial version while, while still completely recovering. It was basically early 2019 where that happened. And then raised some money mid-2019. There's a whole story on that and how not a single in, uh, investor uh, wanted to invest in our product. Uh, and, and, but, but it, it, which, which is actually quite funny because it's about networking again. You know, 
everything's about uh, getting in front of someone and not sending them an email pitch or something like this. And so the 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 then you know the rest is history from probably November 2019. Yeah, and uh, uh, actually, um, for people, so just to everybody here listening, you are in Hopin. Uh, but uh, uh, Johnny, can you tell us a little bit wh what is Hopin today? Uh, you know, what you can share with us, uh, location, how many are you building the product? Uh, you know, how many events do you run? Like, what you can share with us? Yeah, so uh, Hopin today has over 100,000 organizers from across the globe. We, uh, we do software for many stages of the events. We do virtual event. We've just expanded out into marketing, which you'll see event marketing, which will span out in uh, two months, probably. Uh, you'll see the main effects of this on for people like Mehdi and other organizers and, uh, who are available. Uh, we just acquired a company called Boomset, which is on-site event technology. And on top of that, we are also, you know, in investing heavily into the data part of events. So what that means is, uh, Hopin, we're aiming to be, for an event perspective, the whole full circle so that you can run uh, any event you want uh, and get all the data, whether it's physical event or virtual or hybrid event, plus all the marketing that's done with the event. All of that is done completely in Hopin. Uh, giving you the best of class product and best of class experience. That's the goal. Now, from a um, from a perspective of the greater company, you know, here's something that I would share, which I don't usually share out loud. But would I mean the question I'd pose to you is: Would Google search and which you know would Google be of one in search had they not acquired and or built Google Ma uh, Google search for images that which they, was acquired Google Maps. And almost all the other parts of Google that fit within their ecosystem. And that question for me is the one that poses how I view Hopin and how I view businesses in general uh, taking advantage of adjacencies, which le led us to the acquisition of StreamYard, which is an adjacent market that makes Hopin better, but at the same time, from an events perspective, at the same time has its own large market. And so that's uh, us. Uh, you know, we have over 15 million users and uh, we're growing super fast. Yeah, and actually, uh, just talking about company strategy, but yeah, it's true that some people have theorized that company build around their they can they cannot go out of their DNA in, uh, without acquisition. So they grow their DNA maximum, and then they have to acquire to make a, a living ecosystem around them. Why eBay acquired PayPal? That then PayPal is no bigger than eBay or no stuff like that, and they have to split. You know, this is this idea. So yeah, definitely we understand that. Yeah, it has to be it has to be like that. So the question is. In the first year, and, and you were sick, uh, recovering, and, and again, what, what a courage to, to build a product in that situation. But how, how did you build the first hop in? What was, what was, how did you get to manage to build your own software, integrate us software other where do, uh, have done? What was the first hoop in lo looking like? Uh, so uh, that's a great question. The first hop in was a really, really, really basic uh, software, i.e., it had. So all of you that are experiencing the event right now, and you can see there's an agenda, stages, work, workshop, roundtables, and an expo, uh, we, we had only one of these features, and it's the one that's not enabled for this event right now, which is called networking. And all it was was a speed networking function for communities to use in their events. There was no reception. There was no stage. There was no, nothing like that for you to actually utilize. So the goal of it was to put people in. If you have 100 people in your community, bring those 100 people and allow them to meet each other for three to four minutes. And that was it. And uh, it was quite a successful feature, but that was the initial version that I built. And from there is when I started expanding it. So it, it was clear, and this is how actually the product formation went. I built the speed networking feature and organizers would say, hey, the speed networking feature is great but I actually wanted to announce something at this event. So it'd be great if I had five minutes before the people go and network to actually talk to everybody and tell them what I'm going to announce. And so I said, great. And that makes total sense. And that's how and then I mapped out a stage. And it was similar around sponsors and uh, sessions. You know, my goal for sessions was, uh, which is, you know, the interactive round tables here are, you know, people want to be in smaller groups where they're actually you know, after receiving some content, maybe they want to, you know, break out things they're interested in and get on a video. And that was a big bet there. 
And so the product was built uh, a little bit by intuition, but also a lot by customer data. And that's what gets us to where we are today. Now, much more recently, it still even looks like that. I think people, uh, you know, you, you hire the most talented people to, you know, a, a good Steve Jobs uh, quote on this is, you hire the smartest people not to tell them what to do, but for them to tell you what to do. And that's really how we view hiring people uh, that are in product because a lot of the time they'll tell us what to do. Yes, and actually, uh, so we've been uh, signing up for Hopin like in February last year. Uh, you know, COVID hit the, hits the world. Can you tell us a little bit the story about what happened? Not about the COVID, but what happened when you were an online conference tool? You had such a wave of people asking you to to uh, to to join and be a customer, like begging to be a customer for some of them, right? W what happens in terms of of company and processes? So when we originally had in February 2020, I think we had 20,000 customers on the wait list. Uh, sorry, people on the wait list. Uh, or, and uh, what it, what ended up happening was so I mean, if you're asking how the form worked, we had a form basically on the website. You connect to that. How did we set up a process? Uh, this was in February. In March, we decided to kind of open up because of what happened with COVID. We said we can't be in beta or wait list. It's unfair. Let's just like open it up completely. Uh, and at the same time, we'll miss an opportunity, both from a business use case and from a moral use case. It doesn't make sense. So the February 2020, um, you, you know, uh, what, what the process was, you fill a form on the website. You, we take your company name. We ask you how big is the event. It goes you, uh, through an API hook to um, uh, to Clearbit. Clearbit goes and like cleans up all the data for you and tells you uh, much more information about that person. Then we have a little bit of uh, our little uh, matching system in the background that's saying, okay, this company runs X amount of events a year type thing. Okay, let's move them to high priority, for example. And this company is looking to run a one-off event once every, you know, maybe once a year, maybe just once not as interesting for us uh, and uh, for right now. Uh, and so that was really how the process worked. Uh, and immediately when they linked up to that, they would get like, it was demos from me at the time. Uh, it was either me or someone else uh, in the company that did a demo and uh, we'd roll them into the, to, to the beta. Now, when we got to a much larger and in, in March, we just allowed everybody in. And that was really, really dangerous uh, because uh, the system wasn't ready for it and we knew that. But thankfully, we only had one problem in all of our events and it ended up being, uh, uh, you know, it was 15 minutes and it was the longest 15 minutes of my life. But it didn't, uh, unfortunately, uh, sorry, fortunately, it didn't kill us. Yeah, so far we never had experienced anything uh, as as customers, so we're happy. Uh, but so yeah, you know, when you have that scale, you cannot build the software yourself. Uh, as you say, now you can acquire companies. Okay, that makes total sense because it's faster. They've they've done it. But when it, when it's early, when it's really the the hockey stick, right? How do you decide what software do you build yourself? To use software you integrate from others. Like what what happens in this in your C in CEO mind? Well, that's a great question. So the build build versus buy question. Uh, there's actually a third part to the build build versus buy. It's build buy, build or buy or integrate uh, or partner, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. partner. And so for us, the big question around integration is: Does this uh, and this we want the majority of things we have in Hopin to be an integration? So you know, in a Hopin event now, you can integrate with Slido, you can integrate with lots of different Kahoot or any of these technologies. Uh, and so we view it similar in a way that um, a lot of companies like Shopify will view it. Is this something that majority of our organ, is this feature or is this product something that the majority of our customers will want to be part of the core experience? And if the answer is yes, then it's more likely that we will build or buy rather than partner. And then when it comes to build or buy, uh, the questions are this, uh, you know, for a buy perspective, being open about it is this product a world-class product, first and foremost? Do their customers love the product? And if the answer is yes, that's great. Then uh, is the product that we're looking to acquire, uh, is it world-class? Uh, on, on, uh, or acquire or build. And the second question is, uh, you know, what does the team look like? Who are the team? Who are the people there, et cetera, getting to know the team. Third is, do they bring revenue uh, or people, uh, like, a like more customers to the platform that we don't have today that should be customers of the entire ecosystem? 
uh, and can be brought in. And if those three are usually yes, then the build part isn't as interesting because you have a longer time period. Obviously, number four would be, is this within our budget? Uh, you know, but uh, the, the, if, if all of three, these three or four work, then you're talking about on a longer scale. You know, building takes a long time. It, and people underestimate, especially like to get people on a team gel to like go through the product. It could take a year to build something. Uh, it takes also a long time to integrate something, but at least you're starting from a head start. You know, you're starting way, you're at least buying yourself half a year to a, a year. And for anyone who knows me, I really care about time. Each individual hour of the day uh, compounds. Uh, if you get, if you save two hours every single day to do some extra work, then you've essentially in a week you've bought a day. If you understand what I mean, uh, so it's a, it's a lot of it's really important to me. So uh, yeah, let's dis let's say you 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 decide to buy or to. Uh, if the, if it's an API, we often say consume. And funny enough, we don't say anymore integrating APIs. You know, that's really the technical version. I love people who say we consume API from others, like to show it's a product, right? You know, this is you consume a product, you integrate a technology, right? So let's say uh, just imagine you have some uh, whatever uh, video streaming technology that comes, and let's say oh, we're great and whatever. What do you what do you look at? What's really important for you as a company that scale? Hi, Johnny, you're on mute. Sorry, I was, I was going to ask. Do you mind repeating that question? I, I, no, I, no, I said, okay, uh, you're, just imagine you need a piece of infrastructure that is important. Let's say, for example, video streaming. And, and you, you want to consume API from others to do that, right? Just uh, you know, at first, uh, on the first version of the product. What, but you reach these 20,000 people who want to come, right? So what will, you, uh, what will you really care about in the discussion with these, let's say, API providers? Like, what, what will the question that you will ask them? So, I mean, the big question for me about API providers is around partnership, because that's what it truly comes down to. It's relationships in the end. Sometimes things don't go well. Uh, sometimes a platform, and I'm sure you have experienced this, sometimes customer support makes the difference. Customer support is a feature for, for someone who's buying, uh, buying software. Like, if this company is really warm, if I feel like if we call them in a panic because something's happening, will they actually say, hey, you know what, you need to send an email request to this 24-hour hotline uh, or, you know, or you know, da -da -da, you know, some sort of complicated system, even if we're a you know, long-time customer and even if we're, paying, if we're paying enterprise support, they're still like, you feel like you're uh, you know, working with a company that doesn't really care about you but cares more about their SLAs, then, yeah, we're going to have a hard time. Uh, we're going to treat that as a pro or con for, for, for choosing them. One of the most important things for us about API providers, it really comes down, I hope I'm answering your question, it really comes down to uh, the, 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 number one, are, are they scalable? Does the, pro, does the API fit? Does the product fit? All, all the stuff, need, our needs. Uh, are they flexible in terms of like, are they ambitious? Are they building more and more to keep us at the most innovative level? And then on top of that, I want to mention like one of the key differentiators that people forget about is that customer support section. It is really, really important to, to get a premium level of customer support. So it seems you care about the humans behind the interface, right? You care about, you know, the processes, the teams. And, and you know, the motto of API Days is connecting the humans behind interfaces. So I, I can only agree with you uh, uh, on that. Awesome. Uh, um, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, so in, in, let's say in the product development, in the product development uh, 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 today, so you also have to acquire, uh, you know, like strategy, right? Uh, and um, and and so the integration, the integration of the of a company being acquired, uh, is it better when there are APIs? Oh, that's such a great question. I, are you saying it's easier to acquire a company that's an API than more than a full app, let's say, or something functioning on some other? Yeah, level? and even internally, you know, the technical stuff like being sure, you know, at least you can access to their stuff by an API, right? I, you know, the the so. I've never acquired an API company, but I've spoken with a lot of CEOs on it, so I can share that. Uh, I can share what I think and also what I, from what I've heard in the data I gathered. I think it's significantly easier to uh, acquire and integrate an API-based company than it is, especially if you're already using them, uh, rather than a web, uh, a, like a totally separate product, uh, because 
you know, they have their own systems. They might be on a, a different use case, et cetera, et cetera. But typically the systems that you're buying as APIs are already built in microservices. They're developer oriented companies. They want to be very like cutting edge. They're ready to move over. Uh, they're less sales driven and the product and engineering teams are hyped to make some uh, adjustments to whatever code they've written to, to make it fit within the company stack. And at the same time, you, you get a lot more innovation from the thing that you're investing in. So for, for me, absolutely, significantly, I think that makes a huge difference. The reason we haven't, we today would only acquire uh, for product innovation rather than gross margins, which a lot of companies acquire for gross margin standpoints on utilizing these APIs. But for us, it would be specifically around product innovation if we felt it made a huge difference to the product. So we had questions uh, earlier uh, to uh, uh, CEO of Twilio and CTO of Algolia, right? About uh, you know the investor point of view about API. So uh, of course you cannot sh you cannot share everything that has been said, but did the API terms was mentioned at least uh, and and where? But maybe it was about what do, would you integrate or will you consume one day? At least the level of discussion with investors did involve let's say some API strategy at some point. We've never had a conversation specifically around, uh, you know, we, we have around, okay, so video is an API endpoint that we uh, consume. We've had many providers and we decided to go and build it in-house. And that was brought on from one of the early investors who said, hey, you should, I mean, we were already going to do it, but we were looking at a product innovation standpoint. Nobody's told us to do it for gross margins. They said maybe in a few years, we thought about it like that. But from an innovation perspective, a few of them said you should own this because it's very important, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it was brought up in a conversation and we agreed that uh, from a product innovation standpoint, a lot of time, you know, all, our whole company is powered by video. So we should have the best video, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. And that was the quote said earlier, you can't buy differentiation. So if you want to differentiate yourself by the, being the best video a streaming platform, you have to do it yourself, else someone else will be able to buy it and compete with you. you. You want to avoid competition, create that gap, and you have to do it yourself, right? I think there was a story like this of Uber uh, Maps, like they were using Google Maps, but that, at one point they understood that Maps was so important that they tried to build in-house Maps because they said, okay, like, look, uh, competition is coming. If, if we are not better than people on Maps and direction and stuff, like, at some point, we will be. Uh, uh, they will catch up with us. So yeah. So it tells a lot about, you know, your how deep and far you want to go. If you say video, uh, you know, the, the video is so key that we have to do it ourselves. Yeah. yeah I know. I agree. It, it, it tells a lot. So um, uh, uh, let's say the Hopin ecosystem right now is quite, it's quite, it's it's quite uh, big. So can you tell us a little bit like exactly what works with what? in the system. You have StreamYard, you have a lot of stuff. So you, you seem to be really a, a huge event platform, you know, uh, uh, like this. But let's say, what's the full user story using Hopper? I think the user story today is very different than the user story in three to six months. So uh, as you know, Medi, we implement, I don't know how, uh, we implement a lot of features. We've been, we're building as if we're still a startup, uh, early, early stage startup, I, in my, in my sense. And, and, and so, you know, we don't even have a public API, but that's one of the first things we want to have so that people can build on top of Hopin. Today, it's a private API. You need to contact us and, in order to build it, which is uh, the opposite of what we want. We want a full-fledged ecosystem where developers can come, build products, build things that make them tons of money and uh, make, get them lots of customers on top of Hopin. We love the Shopify approach and a lot of other companies that are similar in that perspective. Uh, and that's what I expect to see. Now, from an ecosystem perspective, in three to six months, the goal should be for a customer experience is uh, a company that's hosting, whether it's virtual events, physical events, should be uh, or, or hybrid events, should come in, create their first event, have all the options of our event ma marketing platform that allows them to create a website using Hopin to sell tickets from a beautiful website, whatever it is, to send uh, email marketing campaigns via the uh, marketing event marketing kit. Uh, track uh, uh, track the attendee at every single phase of the journey. So they bought, they they went on the website three times, all of this in one platform, whilst at the same time giving them the data about what they're doing at the event, how many minutes do they spend here, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, uh, versus virtually and physically. And so that's the way uh, to, uh, you know, in three to six months, we hope that all of that is aligned from an Hopin perspective and StreamYard is very soon to be the default provider for studio experiences in Hopin, which means that 
you'll get the you know uh, the quality of production that you get on any on, on any Streamyard stream, but you'll be getting it uh, by default in in Hopin in a place where you can see all the chat messages, etc., and it feels part of the experience. Yeah, that makes so the like the full event like infrastructure <laughs> platform, right? So we we have some questions that go a little bit beyond like just uh, whatever uh, Hopin or API discussion, more about like events, like what trends do you see into events? Like from what you see on the market, will we stay online? Will we go back physical events? We will go hybrid. So what you can tell us from what you see? I feel like I could pose this question to you as well. Uh, but I, I would share uh, from what we're seeing and hearing is that the majority, I think there's two functions of the market, and the but the majority of the market, so when it comes to... Uh, virtual and when it comes to hybrid and physical the majority of events are going to be um uh, the majority of uh, events that companies host are going to be either virtual or physical about 30 percent of the events which i call them flagship conferences are probably going to be hybrid i.e there will be a physical and virtual component in the same event whereas the majority of the smaller events companies host or organizations host maybe their workshops maybe their uh, smaller events throughout the year, they're going to be separated in terms of virtual and physical. But most physical events will eventually start over the next few years. And this is just data we're, we're starting to figure out. Over the next few years, always have a hybrid uh, component to it. And that's around the conferences and expos and trade show industry. So basically what I'm trying to say is for, and I didn't explain it well because I think I contradicted for internal company events like a like a, a recruitment fair or a con sorry uh, not a recruitment fair for a, for a you know interview all hands sales kickoffs all of these things they'll either be physical or virtual for big events like conferences trade shows work, uh, all of these sort of things uh, they will all most likely be hybrid if the if they only run it physical there'll still be a hybrid component to it yeah, and for people listening to us, uh, don't hesitate to put your comments or or, uh, or or some questions. I will. You ask me to answer, so I'll answer too. So at least from what we see, so the story API is was here to connect the humans behind API. So we never accepted streaming before, right? Before COVID, we didn't want to do streaming. A lot. Some people ask and say, no, you know, we organize one event in one city per year uh, in the city. So yeah. It, you have to come. You have to talk to the people. You have to mix and mingle. You have to listen to, uh, you know, corridor discussions and 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 learn the secrets that only happens in the physical uh, this uh, world, right? And so, yeah, we were really into that. But COVID came and we went full online. And we think that today, it it will be hybrid forever. We will always have physical event, but we will still be able to onboard at some part uh, people online. And just to say, we will keep some pure online events to have speakers that are too busy to travel, right? But that can give 25 minutes of their time. That was Jeff or Julien or you today, uh, because this is the only way really to gather, to, to have uh, this kind of speakers instead of uh, being the web summit or uh, being this kind of conference. So so I think this is, this is the trend. Some new pure online events and some augmented physical events with uh, whatever streaming capabilities, but good streaming capabilities. You know, the streaming at the time, 2015, 2014, was, was really a poor experience, right? It was really a poor experience. I don't know. The only the only thing I, I don't know is that will people will be really ready to pay for streaming, for streaming? You know, we've seen in the event industry that most of the online events are free. Uh, we don't know yet if people will be able to pay for streaming unless it's high quality and outstanding you know, streaming that that makes you feel like you're you're at the event, but it has to it needs to have the networking and it's it needs to be as much as as a, a physical event value proposition. Yeah, I'm always just uh, brainstorming here as a conference ever event organizer since 2012. Does that make sense? Do you hear that, that kind of uh, comments? I would completely agree. I think it makes total sense. So, uh, uh, so maybe one of the last points uh, uh, there. So if you have any advice to give to new entrepreneurs who wants to build amazing software for amazing products, uh, based on your story, what you've learned, what you've consumed from others that you replaced to build it yourself, yeah, what would be your, your, your advice you can give to uh, entrepreneurs who want to build software? I would say, in general, be passionate in what you're building, for sure. 
But the number one thing, because uh, I can, I, from a developer perspective, product market fit, all of these sort of things, I'm sure you can get this advice from a lot, a lot of people. The one thing that I would share that may be a little bit different is if you want to be the executive or the founder or the entrepreneur behind your own business, unless you plan on staying a tiny, small business of just yourself, learn to pitch. I know that's uh, really random. And what I mean by that is you're going to be pitching potential employees to join you and convincing them that it's worth joining your company. You're going to be pitching potentially investors. And if you're not pitching investors, you're pitching your customers. Uh, you're probably pitching both why they should use you. So, um, you know, you're going to be pitching even when they do join, you're going to be pitching them not to leave when they get bored in a year or two. The point that I'm trying to say is great entrepreneurs, great founders, if that's what you, you if you want to make like continue expanding your company, because maybe you don't, maybe you want it to be a small API, et cetera, which is cool. Uh, but the point is, if you're aiming to build a large organization, you need to get good at pitching. Yes, and actually, when you you will open uh, publicly hop in APIs, you will have to pitch developers, <laughs> right? That's and that, right. Yeah, you will have to pitch developers, and that's actually the, the 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 theme of today. Like the ask your developer journey, your internal developers, but also external developers. How you can convince them to build to build on top of what you're building, you know, to uh, for to generate value for your whole uh, ecosystem. And actually, it's funny, you know, there are really two type of stories. This is why we wanted to invite you. There's the stories of Twilio and Algolia. So you build a product that is an API first directly. It's just that. And you try to make it integrate by everything else, everybody else. Or you are a company like Hopin. You create an amazing product that has outstanding, uh, uh, let's say, uh, attraction. And there is a huge tension of people who wants to integrate with you, who wants to top build on top of you. And then you open. Right. Uh, this is the story of Aircall, for example, the telecommunication uh, company. So, yeah, so we wanted to have you to show these two sides of the story. I will just end by maybe one, one question here. Uh, we, in, in APIs conferences, we talk about how APIs are changing the, 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 the mindset, right? Opening internally, opening externally. There is a quote often we, that we say that the competition was product versus product. It is platform now. It's platform versus platform. In the future, it will be ecosystem versus ecosystem. And you cannot fight an ecosystem with even with a great product. You know, there's too many time and capital invested into an ecosystem. You know, like Salesforce today, it's not a CRM, it's the business solution for everything. You can make a great CRM, like you know, people will still buy Salesforce for everything else than the CRM. So do do you feel with, with your traction, do you feel that that sentence and do you agree with it? Hundred percent. Not even, I mean, there's nothing, no comment other than you said it yourself. I think that there's no, uh, every, you know, the large, all companies today are moving into ecosystem models, which allow other companies to be built on top of them, but allow them to keep the core platform, uh, you know, of, of their product. Yeah. So let's see the hopping ecosystem uh, being growing. And uh, and again, as customer, we'll be glad to uh, to be part of it. Uh, thank you very much, Johnny. So much. I think we're at the time. Uh, and uh, and yes, and, and you can count on us and all attendees to continue to be part of this of this ecosystem you're building. Well, thank you so much, Mehdi. It's an absolute pleasure, and hope I hope it was useful for at least some some person in the crowd. Uh, I think it was. So uh, thank you for that. Take Hi, care. Jenny. Perfect. See you at next conference. <laughs>